Hello and welcome back to Pause for Prayer and our next video encouragement to press the pause button on our busy lives and to be present to God. Amidst our busy lives of work, study and family life, not to mention the endless noise and distractions, we acknowledge the urgent need to learn how to stop, to be silent and to pray. Stay tuned now as we add to our toolkit, discovering another method of prayer, hear another testimony, and are presented with some more prayer intentions. Hello and welcome back to Pause for Prayer. After our own recent pause for the high moments of Lent and Easter. During Lent, of course, we were focusing a lot on the three ancient practices of prayer, fasting and almsgiving. And I thought today we could take that one almsgiving or charity and, and to explain the fact that that's not supposed to only be a focus that we have as Christians during Lent, but that it's an integral part of Christian life that we be people of charity and that we give alms. In a certain sense today, I'd like us to focus on the unity between our charitable work and our prayer. Of course, prayer, our speaking with God, doesn't always have to be distinct from our service of God, our charitable action. Indeed, if we're to take seriously the command in St. Paul to pray unceasingly, we have to understand it in terms of a command to love unceasingly, both in our words and words addressed to God, but also in our actions and therefore our service of God. If we look at the tradition of the church, the spiritual tradition, we, we see so many great examples of this in the saints and in other people. And when I was reflecting, I was thinking a lot about the works of Brother Lawrence. For those of you that uh, don't know Brother Lawrence, Brother Lawrence was an unlearned man, a, a servant or footman um, in the mid 17th century who entered um, the Discalced Carmelites as a lay brother. And his predominant role was that of the community's cook. Uh, but he has these great writings about um, how his action, his service to his community and to others was his prayer and certainly was intertwined with it. I'd just like to reflect with you on a few of his insights and perhaps actually just read from, uh, from a book um, about him and with his own words as well. Take this for example. A kitchen and an altar were as one to him, and to pick up a straw from the ground was as grand a service as to preach to the multitudes. The time of business, he said, does not with me differ from the time of prayer. In the noise and the clutter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees with the Blessed Sacrament. This unity between prayer and action was central, a central insight for Brother Lawrence. And um, he writes about this in invitation for us all to practice the presence of God, to be attentive to God's presence, not just in the time of prayer, say in church or in the chapel, but also in our very messy, ordinary, everyday lives. Um, let me read a testimony now about him. Um, so this comes from a conversation that was made with him, uh, a living testimony. He writes, It is a great delusion to think that the times of prayer ought to differ from other times. We are st as strictly obliged to adhere to God through action in the time of action, as through prayer in the season of prayer. As for Brother Lawrence, his prayer was nothing else but a sense of the presence of God, a sense of his soul being at the tame, same time unaware of anything, of everything except divine love. And when the appointed times of prayer in the church were passed, he found there was no difference because he still continued with God, praising and blessing him with all his might, so that as he passed his life in continual joy, he was attentive 
to God in all things. Indeed, that is the invitation for us, to be attentive to God in all things, not just in the church. This time I had the great joy of sitting down with Karen Tian from the St Vincent de Paul Society in my own parish here at St Dunstan's in Kings Heath. And I spoke with her about how her work with the society is an integral part of her life of faith. So I suppose when we pick up the Bible, um, right from the very beginning, we hear Jesus sort of telling us to clothe the naked and feed the hungry. And then when I sit and reflect back, even on the life of the early church, there is this great, um, yeah, this great outreach, really, towards those that are less fortunate. Um, a great wing of charity within the church, particularly towards, say, the widowed and others that are struggling. And um, when I was reflecting a little bit about, well, where are we at today with that sort of uh, charity? I was thinking about things like the St. Vincent de Paul Society. And I know, Karen, you're a, that's a, something very dear to you, your life. And, and so perhaps, um, if you wouldn't mind, would you just share to us a little bit about how you got involved with the St. Vincent de Paul Society and and what it's about and how that engages your faith. Yeah. Would you mind? Um, I got involved because um, when I was head of sixth form, I was very aware that Christmas was a particularly difficult time for a lot of families. Yeah. Um, and it, the way things were, there was a, with the economy and, and everything, I, was, I, I thought that there would be a lot of families who, who would struggle. And so I spoke to Father Philip about perhaps do a fundraiser and um, buy families a Christmas bag, if you like, Lovely. with turkey and vegetables and mince pies and things. And, and he said, good idea, but speak to Andy Godge, who's the president of the SVP, oh. um, and perhaps tie it in with the work that they do. Um, and I didn't know too much about it. My father-in-law was a member of the SVP, but... You know, I, died a very very long time ago and as far as I was aware it was just sort of visiting lonely people um, but then I went to the first meeting um, and it, it wasn't as I expected it was it was very lovely uh, Deacon David would read a passage from scripture and then um, have a reflection and mm. obviously very sort of pointed towards the work um, and then uh, I told them what I uh, about my idea, and they everybody agreed it was a, a good one, and there was a need for it. Yeah. And um, very much, as you said, it's very much um, uh, rooted in the in in the work of Jesus. It's not uh, one of the prayers is that we're not doing things um, when, when we are successful. It's not down to us. Yeah. It's down to the intervention of the divine, um, and so. Uh, we did that, and um, we, oh, there were other things. There was a, a particular f um, woman that I, I was involved with. She was referred by social services, yeah. and she was um, she had learning difficulties, and she was in a, a terrible model. And I didn't really know what to do. We we provided her with food and clothing. She'd got herself into a bit of bother, um, but it was. But really, uh, it wasn't really hitting the root of the matter. And yeah. so just prayer to do the right thing and say the right thing. And eventually um, I managed to get hold of a social worker. And mm. it was a great relief, I have to say, which is not something I'm a, I am find very admirable. But it was a relief to be able to pass the responsibility yes. on someone else because I wasn't equipped really to help mm. her. Um, and then COVID came and there were difficulties there, but we um, we were giving um, food vouchers for uh, the supermarket and um, at just transferring money for gas and electricity and things like that. It, it was a, a remote time. There was no visiting, obviously, but we could yeah. help and do what we could and, and just listen when people phoned, you know, it was... It was Bless, yeah. yeah. Um, but then since then, um, with the, the economy crisis, we've had an increasing number of people who've, sure. who've needed our help. Um, sometimes it is um, practical help with food or yeah. uh, money for gas and electricity or... Um, or, or
um, white goods because there is a charity which is it's a Christian charity, not not just a Catholic charity, um, called Acts Four Three Five, and it does fundraising. It's like a GoFundMe sort of thing. Yeah. And well, one of our members, she does all the paperwork for that, and you put a potted history of the person without naming them, obviously, mm. um, and what they need and. People will fund up to two hundred pounds. Yeah. So they have been every single one I've requested has been met. It's been really wonderful. That's been Praise a, God. Yeah, absolutely. Um so although two hundred pounds very often doesn't cover it all, mm. it covers a great chunk of it. Yeah. So it hasn't meant that the conference money has been depleted too much. You know, yeah. it's just um but it's um the food banks and the money that is donated, which which really keeps us going. Um, most parishes do have some sort of box for food bank collection, yeah. and many have um, a money box as well. So, mm. if you're able, then you know it, it is. It, it, well, it's absolutely essential because people can't. Mm. They are often through absolutely no fault of their own, just not able to drag themselves out of that particular mire and it's it's yeah. up to us to listen primarily um and then and then do what we can so food banks um i think the really essential things are things like um tin meat um and uh think and cheese and it's protein because it's what um when you look at the, particularly the school masses, when you see the children who you know come from families who are struggling, yeah. they're overweight not because they eat too much, but because they eat the wrong things like mm. that are cheap um, and filling. Um, so it's it's really making sure that they get the other nutrients because it is a very very unequal world and. I think it really upsets me when people say, well, it's their own fault or they should do this or they should do that. When you come from a family who've always been supportive and you've come from a place of love, yeah. then it is easy to sort yourself out and to love others. And I think it's a very different story if you haven't had that. Yeah. Um and not only the the um, support of family, but the support of the church. And and um, 2017 was a very bad year, and because um, my daughter-in-law died, and then my husband and my cousin's daughter I was very close to, and without without God and without the parish and the people around me, it would have been easy to just sort of sink into this. Abundancy. It was really mm. so. That's been really, really, very important. And I think prayer. My prayers mostly are to with this to to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to be guided mm. by the Holy Spirit into whatever is going to make things better, and not weighed in just with yeah. loads of enthusiasm and not much sense really. Um, so I think um, it it is really what well, it is. It's it's the whole raison d'être. It's, it's the point of it is to is to serve God and mm. and fellow your fellow people. Mm. Wonderful. Lots for us to do. And lots to do. Lots yeah. to do. The, the, and to pray. For. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But both and by the sounds of it. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> both. Yes. Yes. Just to be guided and. And to to be aware of what's going on, I think you know mm. people are very, on the whole, are very reluctant to ask for help, and mm. um, a misguided sense of shame or that they haven't managed it. Everybody needs help, and it's you know, as I say, it's my good fortune that I've I've had it. Yeah, and so now it's an opportunity to sort of give from the gifts that we've already been given, given. almost. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And all, all motivated on love, love. and the Christ mm. love. Mm. Oh, it's wonderful. Sitting, I could sit and listen to you all day, Karen. And you're very kind, <laughs> Mother. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode, anyway. Oh, thank and you very God much. God bless for you in your me. life and mission. Thank you. 
for another lived example of prayer and action. We hear now from Stephanie. Hello, my name is Steph. To say I currently work in the migration sector would be true. I work for two amazing local charities, Stories of Hope and Home and Birch Network. But it would also in some ways be a misrepresentation. I've certainly found the current outworking of my vocation in working with and for and alongside people seeking sanctuary. But I have also found among them a community I consider myself immensely privileged to be a part of. Many of the people seeking sanctuary I encounter have an incredibly strong faith. Others have rejected religion entirely and having heard the stories, I can understand both. Many of those who do similar work to me do so inspired by their faith. Others are inspired by our shared humanity with no sense of the divine. And I can understand both of these, too. I could talk endlessly about my work. I find it much harder to articulate my thoughts about God and faith and prayer. But for all it is less easy to put into words, I do know that making space for prayer is important to me. I genuinely believe that the foundation of prayer, and particularly silence, which I have tried to build into my life, means that more becomes possible. Not as a direct cause and effect, Jesus told me to do this so I did kind of way, but in a way that is deeper and much more mysterious. This is not about compartmentalising prayer. There are plenty of other parts of my life which feel like places where I encounter God, but I recognise the value in the conscious carving out of time to pause and be present. Partly, it is simply about stopping. I love my full, busy, rich and complicated life, but having time when I am not doing but simply being also matters. There is something about accepting not being in control, not having to do everything, which feels deeply necessary in a world where there is so much that needs to be done and can't. Primarily though, for me, prayer is about consciously experiencing the unconditional love of God. There is something about knowing myself to be loved, which both helps me to love myself enough to cope with all the stuff I cannot do, all the things I cannot solve, mm -hmm. as well as increasing my energy and feeding my capacity to offer my own imperfect version of what love I can to others. There's a saying that says justice is what love looks like in public, and perhaps it is equally true that prayer is what love looks like in the deepest parts of ourselves. In the end, maybe I didn't need to witter on and say all of this. Maybe the interplay is simply that they are both about love. Well, that's it for this episode of Pause for Prayer. We hope that it's been useful to reflect on the unity between our prayer and our charitable action. Until next time, we wish you peace.